fantastic to see you all here this evening to support international solidarity through Union Aid Abroad of FIDA. And uh, I want to say a big thank you to all of the, the unions that are represented here tonight. And I can see a lot of old friends in the room. It's fantastic to see you all. Um, I want to um, I want to just say, as, um, as Kate Lee, Lee, Lee said in the video, that your support uh, for Union Aid Abroad, the FIDA, is more important than ever. Um, as wealthy nations like the US and like Australia are reducing or cancelling their aid altogether to places like Palestine. Now, I'd like to also acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people as the true owners of this land and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Of course, Indigenous Australians and Palestinians have much in common. They're both peoples who understand very well what it's like to be dispossessed of their land, to be colonised, to be excluded, to be discriminated against, to be massacred, to be forgotten. I want to acknowledge our special guests, Helen McHugh, um, Dr. Helen McHugh, the co-founder of Afida, and her good friend and our guest speaker, Dr. Olfat Mahmoud, who I will be introducing um, very shortly. But first, um, as you heard uh, already from Ruth, I was based in Gaza uh, for two and a half years, from 2002 to 2004, uh, when I worked as a lawyer for UNRWA, the UN agency responsible for the Palestinian refugees. One of my roles was to write reports for the UN General Assembly and the Security Council uh, on violations of international human rights and humanitarian law. And believe me, I was kept very, very busy. Um, it's impossible for anyone with an open mind who goes to Palestine or who interacts with Palestinian refugees to remain unaffected by a feeling of deep injustice. And that injustice is rooted in the events of 1948 and all that followed. While I was based in Gaza, I witnessed the Israeli bombing campaigns, the targeted assassinations and the civilian death toll, the killing and maiming of Palestinian refugee children attending UN schools. One incident involved a 13-year-old schoolgirl from Rafa, Imam al-Hams, who wandered into an area out of bounds by the Israel army declared out of bounds by the Israel army. According to soldiers' accounts, their commanding officer shot Imam in the head and emptied his magazine into her body. He was acquitted by the army, which had accepted that he had fired into the ground near the girl. He was later compensated with many thousands of dollars, had all his legal expenses paid, and he's since been promoted. The only reason this case is unusual is because it was documented and Israel went through the motions of charging that officer. In actual fact, these kinds of events occur all the time, and usually nothing at all happens. UN staff members were not immune from attack either. An UNRWA medical officer, Kamal Kamdan, was shot dead in the back of a UN ambulance after the ambulance had been given clearance by the Israeli Defence Forces to proceed into the refugee camp to collect wounded refugees. Israel falsely claimed there'd been a Palestinian militant hiding in the ambulance. When that was refuted by the UN, it refused to engage on the issue any further. A British UN staff member, Ian Hook, was standing in a UN compound in the Janin refugee camp, talking on his mobile phone to the Israel Defence Forces, when he was shot in the back by an Israeli sniper, situated in a high building overlooking the compound. The UN ambulance was then prevented by the Israel Defence Forces from entering the compound to collect Ian, requiring UN staff to smash a hole in the fence to take him out. Ian died in the ambulance on the way to hospital. Israel initially falsely claimed Ian had been holding a gun. Apart from a statement from the UN Secretary General expressing concern and requesting a thorough investigation, nothing ever happened in response to this and other war crimes against UN staff. Now, this is UN staff, some of them international staff. And if that happens to those people, you can imagine what carte blanche it is for uh, Israelis to act against Palestinians. In the end, 65 UN staff in Israel and the occupied territories, including me and my boss, 
the head of the International Legal Division of UNRWA, issued an open letter calling for an independent investigation and accountability for Israel. An unprecedented action from UN officials who take their impartial status seriously. When still nothing happened after that, we realised that Israel could act with impunity and no one was safe. I also documented the daily bulldozing of ancient olive groves, orange orchards and greenhouses, the prohibitions on fishermen in Gaza going to sea, on shepherds grazing their sheep and goats, the bombing of Palestinian homes, factories, schools and police stations, the delays and harassment of Palestinians and UN staff at checkpoints, the deaths of mothers and babies held up at checkpoints on their way to hospital, the imprisonment without charge of hundreds, sometimes thousands of Palestinians, including children, on so-called administrative detention. In one case, I remember vividly, a pregnant refugee woman had been ordered at a checkpoint to drink a bottle of bleach. It burnt out her throat and her insides. In occupied East Jerusalem and the West Bank, almost every aspect of life and the economy was controlled by checkpoints, closures, curfews, settlements and their buffer zones and settler-only roads, the wall, house demolitions and an opaque administrative system of permits that severely restricted freedom of movement, access to services and the capacity of Christians and Muslims to access holy places. I saw firsthand how the Israelis had devised literally thousands of ways to make life difficult for the Palestinians. In a later visit to Gaza as part of the Parliamentary Friends of Palestine, a trip that was facilitated by AFIDA, we witnessed how the economic blockade on Gaza over the past decade has prevented Palestinians from leaving Gaza or trading with the outside world, crippling the economy and making more than 80% of these proud people dependent on food aid. More than 60% of Gaza's youth are unemployed, the highest rate in the world. There are thousands of young people graduating each year from school and university without any prospects to obtain work and lead lives of purpose and dignity. And of course, the whole world has seen the contempt and barbarity with which Palestinians in Gaza, protesting <coughs> peacefully, were treated by Israel during the recent massacres. It is appalling that Australia and the US voted against the UN Human Rights Council resolution calling for an independent international investigation into the Gaza massacres. Australia, as a respected middle power country, is in a position to play a constructive role as an honest broker in the Israel-Palestine conflict, provided we are consistent in our support for the international rule of law, whether applied to China's island building activities in the South China Sea, Israel's illegal settlement building activities in Palestine, an international investigation into the Gaza massacres or supporting the Palestinian refugees' right of return. To be truly effective on the international stage, Australia needs to break away from its policy of strategic dependence on the United States, which has led us into... <laughs> this policy has led us into disastrous wars in Vietnam and Iraq, and to foreign and defence policy positions that are counter to our own national interests, including unconditional support for Israel. In short, Australia needs a truly independent foreign policy. There are already 137 nations that recognise the state of Palestine. That's more than 70% of the world. Australia should join that consensus. Australia should support an end to the occupation of Palestine and the right of return of Palestinian refugees. Security for both Israelis and Palestinians is a legitimate issue, but it should be understood that there is no parity of power in this equation. Israel is one of the largest military powers in the world and the only military power in the Middle East. It has militarily occupied Palestine and crushed Palestine for 51 years. The truth is that there is no balance in the Israel-Palestine question. <coughs> The truth is that there can be no balance between the occupier and the occupied, between tanks and stones, between one of the world's largest military powers and an impoverished, dispossessed people. So while much has rightly been said and written about the suffering of Palestinians in Israel and in the occupied territories, 
the situation of the refugees outside has been given scant attention. The story of the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon is a story that is not often heard. And as we see in Olfat's book, Tears for Tashia, parallel justice injustices have been experienced by those refugees in Lebanon. Through Olfat's vivid recollections of growing up in the refugee camp in Beirut and her work as a nurse and women's community leader, we have a window into the experiences of Palestinian refugees living in war-torn Lebanon. And we have eyewitness accounts of the most obscene atrocities, including the Shabra and Shatila massacres of refugees in Lebanon, and the responsibility borne by both Lebanese militia and Israel in many of those atrocities. <coughs> It's clear that Olfat has, has inherited her um, incredible storytelling ability from her parents and grandparents. Through Olfat's retelling of their stories of the village of Tashia in the Upper Galilee and the forced mass expulsion of Palestinians in 1948, we gain a personal glimpse of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, known as Nakba or the catastrophe and the dream of return that sustains millions of Palestinian refugees. Courtesy of Olfat's writing, you as the reader are there in Tashia, happily living your own life in your own house, in your own village in Palestine, as your forefathers have done for centuries before you. Suddenly, you and your family are violently forced at gunpoint to leave. You lock up the house and carefully store the key expecting you will be back soon. Your family makes the dangerous journey by foot to Lebanon, but your two youngest children die of illness on the way. When you arrive, you are herded into a refugee camp and you find a small piece of ground for you and your family to shelter on until you can go home. The days turn into weeks, months, years and decades. During this time, you and your family and neighbours are persecuted, harassed, denied fundamental rights, not allowed to have electricity, water or proper houses, not allowed to work in most jobs, and required to obtain permission for everything, even growing vegetables. You are then caught in the crossfire of Lebanon's vicious wars. Not only has Israel kicked you out of your home, but it follows you to Lebanon and persecutes you there. Already traumatised, you are re-traumatised. Olfat's story is important, because it is the story of every Palestinian refugee. And it reminds the world that the right of return of the Palestinian refugees is a fundamental issue for any resolution of the Israel-Palestinian conflict. This is a right that has been repeatedly recognised in international law and UN resolutions, but this right has been constantly denied them by Israel and has largely been ignored in peace negotiations with the complicity of the international community. Olfat's ongoing campaign to keep her people's predicament in public consciousness has taken her to many countries and recently, at the highest international level, to a meeting with the UN Secretary General in New York. In addition to being the proud mother of four boys, the director of a Palestinian women's humanitarian organisation, an internationally recognised peace activist, a registered nurse, and most recently the recipient of a doctorate, Olfat is also a stateless Palestinian refugee, a descendant of the Christian and Muslim people who were forced from their homeland in 1948 by the Israeli military during the Nakba. Her determination to help her people in their fight to return home led to a nursing career that has placed her at the front line of some of the most atrocious massacres and wars the Middle East has yet witnessed. Yet Tears for Tashia also chronicles people's remarkable capacity for love and bravery in the most extreme conditions. Tears for Tashia, published by Wild Dingo Press, is Olfat's first step on the road to return to her village in Palestine. It is a truly compelling read and I urge you all to obtain a copy tonight if you haven't already done so. Personal commitment and activism contributing to international solidarity is critical to achieving a more just world. That is why Olfat has written her book and why she's here tonight. And would you please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Olfat. <laughs> Good 
Good evening. And in Arabic we say, Salamu Alaikum, which means peace upon you. And we are accused, we are against peace. And we start our greetings with peace. Um, first of all, let me thank Union Aid Abroad Afida for bringing me to Australia. And this is my ninth visit, but the first one to Perth. Uh, <laughs> and I love the city. It's very peaceful and very beautiful. Um, also, I would like to thank the organizer of this event. I won't tell names because I'm sure I will miss out some names. Also, I would like to thank my dearest sister, Australian sister, Dr. Helen McHugh, who I have been knowing here for 36 years. Can you imagine? I was still studying nursing. And uh, before I talk about my relation with Afida, let me brief you about the situation of the refugees outside the Palestinian territories, because it's another story which you don't see in the media. Um, and also, I would like to tell you that Afida was born from Burj al Barajni Palestinian refugee camp in 1980. The idea started in 1983, and Afida established in January 1984. First of all, Burj al Barajni camp is the camp I come from. It's located in Beirut, in Lebanon. Uh, very close to the airport, 10 minutes away from the airport. It's only one square kilo, less than a square kilometer. And the population in year 2012 was 27,000. And now, 45,000. After the Syrian war, many Palestinian Syrians, they left Syria and they came and joined their relatives and they share the very little resources. To be a refugee, it's very painful. Look at me. Am I a human being or not? Of course I'm a human being. But the world is treating me as non-human being. I exist, but no one recognizes me. I'm labeled as not only refugee, refugee stateless. And they have no right to label me like that because I am not stateless. I have a state. My grandparents, 70 years ago, they were there. But still, I'm stateless. I'm a refugee. In a refugee camp like Burj al Barajni, which is about three football playing grounds that host 45,000 people. It's not about the density. It's about more social things, like you don't have a privacy. It's just house next to another house, small houses. So you have no privacy. Children, they have no place to play. It's very small alleyways. I have some people here sitting in this hall. They came and they worked in Burj al Barajni camp as volunteers. And they know what I'm talking about. We have some roads. Come take two people together. You have to walk one behind one. And as you mentioned, we have, because we are refugees, we are deprived from our rights, basic rights even. We have no right to access clean water. Do you know what we do? People can't afford buy the bottled water. People go to the city and buy the city water. It's cheaper. Until now, 70 years, and we have no right to access electricity. Imagine you live in the 21st century, the century of technology, and we are deprived from electricity, which means how can our students study, make projects, or these things? They need internet. Most of the time, there is no internet because there is no electricity. Sometimes we don't see the electricity for weeks. As I said, no, we don't, you don't find any tree in the camp. We don't enjoy the green 
parks or green trees or anything like that. It's house next to another house. And never built to be permanent. People always hope that they will return back, and they never. So these houses are not even strong. They never built on, with foundation. And if we have a small earthquake, the whole camp will collapse. And Beirut is on, or Lebanon, is on earthquake zone. And on the TV now, they say they expect one soon. So it's not enough we are frightened from the political situation and the unsettled situation. Also, people are scared if something, want, like an earthquake or anything like that, the whole camp will collapse. Why all of this? What we have done? Our, my grandparents, actually, I was born as a refugee. It's not my choice. Even I did not choose to be a refugee. I was born as a refugee. My children were born as refugees. And that means we don't carry passports like you. So our movement is very limited. I travel here because Union Out Abroad Afida, they invited me. Otherwise, I can't just go to any embassy and apply for visa or go to any country. My story started even before I was born. It started actually in 1917, when Belford, the former foreign minister, British foreign minister, promised the Jewish to create a country for them. And that country was my country. The conflict started. And in 1947, the League of Nations, to solve this problem, they decided to divide Palestine into two states one for Jewish and one for the Palestinians. Of course, it didn't work, and then we had the war in 1948 when people were forced at gunpoint to leave. As a teenager, I used to be very angry because always at the checkpoints, I will be humiliated. I am a refugee. I remember I used to be very angry and go to my grandmother and shout at her why she left Palestine. And poor my grandmother used to say, I needed a safe place to my children. I did not leave to be a refugee. I did not choose that. I, I wanted just a safe place. I looked at my children when I hear the bombing, when I hear about Deir Yassin massacre, I couldn't, I couldn't bear to stay and see my children dying in front of my eyes. And this is why I decided to leave. And then when I became a mother myself, one day they were heavy fighting around my house. And I had two children. One was around three years and the other one, like one month. I didn't know what to do. I was so scared holding them and wanted, believe me, at that time I was praying to be like a bird where I can fly with my children. People never choose to be a refugee. It's not, it's not, they are forced to leave their country. And believe me, if people know what is waiting for them, they wouldn't make it. My grandmother said, if I knew that I will end up as a refugee with really limited rights and live li that life, I would have preferred to die with my children and not leaving my house. It's enough that we, it's not enough that we lost our land and our homes to be treated like that. Why? And it's a well-known fact, Palestinians, before 1948 war, they were the richest in the Middle East. And this is my message in the book. We are, I, don't, I don't want people to feel pity for us. It's not about that. It's about we have rights, and we want people to support our rights. It's a human rights. I'll ask you, 
why all of us believe in international human rights? Why are, I am a human being, why I don't enjoy human rights? Why? And this is what we want. We want to be supported, to gain our rights, to have rights like all human beings, to have the right of return, which was guaranteed under UN Resolution 194, which was issued in 1949. There is a resolution, UN Resolution 194, but not implemented. So why there is no pressure on the UN to implement their resolutions? And when I talk to people about the right of return, do you know what they say? This is a common respond. Uh, but this is not realistic. Then what is realistic? If this is not realistic, okay, fine. Give me a realistic solution. No one say one word. So then what? Shall we keep this life and suffer in every second in our life? It's not accepted. So we urge the international community to do something. And today I was uh, on one of the radios, I forget the name, here in Perth, and they asked me, why do you think the world is standing beside Israel? I said, I want to ask this question. I want to know why. It's, it's, it's very easy, one plus one equal two. I still have the papers to prove that Tarshiha, I have land there, my grandparents' land. I still have the paper. I have the key to my grandparents' house. We bleeded enough to change the attitude of the international community. We don't want to plead more. And please help us not to plead. Because people have, you know, they can tolerate, tolerate, but then, then what will happen? Our young people are not working. In Lebanon, and since the majority of you here are unionists, we have no right to work in 72 jobs. And that leaves us with roughly nothing because we are refugees. How we can survive if we can't work? And the problem, as mentioned, Trump, the USA, they cut the fund for the Palestinian refugees in all territories. West Bank, Gaza, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, wherever they operate, they cut the fund. And our children won't be able to go to school because we don't have other options, except the private schools, which are very expensive, especially in Lebanon. So the whole generation will be out without school. What do you expect from this generation? They are losing the hope, they have no life, they are threatened in their, in all their life, so what they will do? And then we will blame them, and they will be on the newspapers and on the magazines, terrorists. I'll tell you, to be frank with you, as a refugee, when I travel and I go through all these securities, measurements. I get scared. <laughs> but actually, this, this is not the solution. The solution is people should enjoy their rights. And this is the good bit of the talk. In spite of everything, this miserable scene, we are very strong. And for example, I'm a Palestinian woman. I'm very proud of being Palestinian. I have a cause to live for, and I don't want to change my nationality. No one has the right to force me to change my nationality as well. It's my decision. I should be given the right to return, and then it's my decision if I want to migrate or I want to stay. No one has the right to force me. And I'm not a victim, and I don't want to be a victim. I am a survivor. And this is why 
we stand up and we want to do something to ourselves. This is why in 1993, I myself and a group of active women established the Women's Humanitarian Organization. We studied the needs with the help of Dr. McHugh. We studied the needs of the community at that time and designed projects to help those women and their families, not just women. We are not taking, we are not a women's humanitarian organization that means we are against men, no. But we work with women and her family. And we have different projects until now run by us through AFIDA, such as refugees, women, uh, or refugees, not just women, looked in camps. So what we do, we do, we run lots of workshops for these women, such as positive parenting, not because they don't know, but they are really depressed. So we want them to be able to cope with the situation and try to um, understand what, what they are going through. So we run different workshops on positive uh, parenting, on health issues, related to the woman herself and to her children and family. We do counseling as well to help women cope with their problems. Um, we have female clinic because with UNRWA, they are very good in pre and postnatal care, but not on female health. Uh, we have after school tutoring program for children who are at risk to drop out. We don't know what we will do this year if no fund and no schools. Uh, also, we have something called ALP, Accelerated Learning Program for Syrian refugees because they left the schools for a few years and to be able to return back to school, we design condensed program to send them, after they finish this program, we send them back to normal schools. We have health program for elderly, old gen older generation, because in the camps, Due to stress, people have chronic illnesses. It's common. It's most of people, they have chronic illnesses. Not just when they are old, even middle age. I give you example, myself. I'm already, I have diabetes and high blood pressure. So most of people are really sick and we don't have much services. So we run this program where nurses, they go to people's homes and uh, do their blood tests and uh, check their blood pressure, give them advices and all of this. Unfortunately, this program was funded for a uh, few years and now we are struggling. Only we get a fee money for this program, which is not much. Uh, this is the problem of the world. We are not the fashion anymore. And I heard also many NGOs would say, why we should invest in old people? They are dying. What's that? Even if they are dying, let them die in peace at least. And we run different programs to keep the culture. The Palestinian culture, because it's another identity, we don't want to lose it. So we do lots of embroidery, needlework, we, do, we teach the kids the traditional dancing, depka, the folk, singing, all of this stuff. Uh, we also collect oral history, you know, 70 years we have been on exile. So, all people are dying. So, we collected good material uh, to keep the culture and to pass it through other generations. We have it on uh, CDs and written in books. So all of this, it's resiliency. It's we are not just waiting the world to help us. We need your help. But we also, we are active and we do lots of things. My message, it's for you. It's to put pressure on your government to change their attitude towards refugees. It is, it is very important. 
And also, I hope they won't follow America and cut their fund. And this is what frightens all the Palestinians now. It's because, you know, whatever America is doing, the whole world is, you know, follow, the, follow them. So we hope no one will follow America and cut their fund. And I, my people ask for peace, but peace alone is not enough. We ask for peace and justice. We ask for peace and justice. Peace without justice means nothing. And we need your help. We need your help so we can reach justice. And this is what I should actually thank Afida for, because we don't look at Afida as just sending money or uh, they are partners. They are partners. And when Afida started, it started, as I said, from Burj al Barajni Palestinian refugee camp, when Helen McHugh used to work there with us after Sabra and Shatila massacre, which I am one of the survivors of this massacre. I met Helen after that, and she worked with us in the Palestinian Crescent, in the Palestinian Crescent Society. She worked about six months, and then she told me, oh, it's better if I go back to Australia and raise awareness there, and instead of me here working by myself, maybe I will, many people will work. And this is what she did. She left Lebanon on the 30th of March, 1983, and started until January uh, 1984. I remember she called me and she said, we started an organization now, and it's called Afida. I told her, Helen, Afida has an Arabic meaning. Afida means to benefit. Yeah, and it's, it came by coincidence. And this is how we started working with Afida since, even before it was established. I remember as as mentioned, I was a nurse. I started my career as a nurse. I wanted to tell you one thing. Palestinians love education because they believe education is another identity. When you lose, when you become a refugee, means you lost your dignity. So by, edu by education, somehow it brings dignity back again. This is why they are fighting us now with education. This is why they want to stop schools. And I remember my parents always brought me up to say, you have to be well educated. But of course you need the resources. I went to nursing first. And because we don't have university as Palestinians, you have to pay for your education, all private. I worked for many years to save some money and went back to university to do uh, degree in psychology and sociology. Then I did my master psychology uh, special needs. I did one year diploma in women's studies and then I did my PhD in positive psychology. And in spite of all negativity, I decided to do it in positive psychology. And I did it only, I, ha I had it two years ago. So we need the resources we have the intention, but we don't have the resources. And this is very important. Also, we need as well to let people enjoy peace. How people would ask for peace or know about peace if they never experience peace? It's very difficult. And I will end up my speech with one story to make you laugh after all of this. In 1983, I got scholarship to go to London and do a course in a clinical instruction. Um, from the camp to London, and no social media at that time. Like, you know, now the whole world is open. When I went to London, I, um, 
stayed with a friend for the first week. So the first day I arrived, I stayed with an English nurse who used to work with us as volunteer. In the same building, there were Palestinian students from Palestine. So they came to say hello, and they want to take me to the cinema. I went inside the room, and I was delayed. So they started to say, the film will start. You, what, what are you doing? And I said, I'm looking for my ID, because I gave them to the, my friend to hide them. They said, oh, why do you want your ID? I said, because of checkpoints. <laughs> they looked at me and said, what? Checkpoints in London? Come, there are no checkpoints. I thought the whole world is like the way I live. And I was 22 years old. I thought the whole world is the same. Actually, I left the room, I left the house without my ID. And I was so scared. I didn't believe them. And walking to the cinema, I was looking around me like, where are the army of this country? Where are the soldiers of this country? I didn't see any on the road. So I started to walk and no one stopped me. And at the checkpoints, I won't tell you how you suffer. So I felt like I'm a better fly. I'm really like free. And that, this was the first time in my life I experienced freedom and peace. And since that time, I became a peace activist. You can't deprive people from all these nice things and then blame them. We need to give people this chance to experience peace, to experience freedom. And we can't do this without your help and support. We need your help and support. And we are very strong to work hard to let the voice of my people heard all over the place. Thank you very much.